You are listening to the On Purpose Podcast, your guide to living a more purposeful life. Welcome, everybody, to this week's edition of the On Purpose Podcast, where the Airstream Studios is currently located in the woods of Oregon, which, while beautiful to look at and hike around, presents some technological challenges. But we're making the most of it, and that's part of living this life on the road and just having the freedom that we chose is the ability to work wherever we are and to overcome issues. And, and that was a big part of this show. But I hope you won't even notice because we got great editing, and the story of our, uh, this week's guest is just fascinating. I, f- I found many parallels between his story and my story as far as what you call guardian angels, some people say, or just people that influence and step in to lead you to places you didn't know you could be or that to become what you didn't know you could become. And I love the fact that he's also wrote a book called When the Rain Stops, similar to mine, in which he's saying thank you for the roles you played in his life and where you led him. And now he's a, a Hollywood producer, director, involved in movies, music videos, advertising, with a lot of big credentials behind his name. But that wasn't what I really wanted to focus on. I wanted to focus on his current book and his sharing his story of his own battle with mental well-being and where the dark places it took him or where it is now. And I love that when somebody is successful on the outside and has achieved so much, they, they don't mind peeling back the layer and say, hey, I'm not always okay. And that was what really brought him to my eyes. And I can't wait for you to inter- uh, listen to this week's interview with John Callis. Sit back, enjoy the show, and then please follow him. Look for his book on Amazon and let me know what you think of Recording the episode. in progress. As always, it's an honor to be here with John, you. John, welcome the to show. the On Purpose Podcast, my friend. How are you doing today? Very good, thanks. Appreciate you having me on your show. Man, it's an honor to have you on the show. I was researching you and getting prepped to interview you and... Man, you've you've got some some pretty serious accomplishments in your life that uh, that I'm interested in some of the stories and, and really I just want to thank you for taking the time to speak out on something such as so critical as our mental well being. You know, um, I guess that was one of the things I was taken back by is how much success you've had, yet you're still speaking out about the importance of our mental health and, and wellness. And what was surprised, what took me there is a lot of times I think we create our own success or we achieve certain things and we always pretend things are great. And, and I love that you went back and said, no, things always haven't been great in my life and I've overcome a lot of it to get here and now I'm going to share my story. So I want to commend you for, for being willing to do that and I, I look forward to this episode. Thank you. Appreciate the kind words. But before we get into the purposeful stuff, John, we got to start with a little warm-up for our mind here. And I like to let the audience know who John is. So let's start with this. You're on a deserted island. You're going to eat one thing the rest of your life. What would John want to be eating? Wow. Interesting question. Uh, for the rest of my life, um, lamb shank. Lamb shank, that's a new one. I've not had that in over almost 300 episodes. I've never heard that one. What are you going to do with that? Uh, eat it every day with a little, uh, um, you know, pasta with it. <laughs> All right. You get a superpower. What would your superpower be and what would you do with it? Well, if I had a superpower, uh, not to make a parallel to Jesus or anything, but I would love to have healing power to take away the pain of people suffering uh, and heal them if they have a disease that's incurable and give them a better life. Mm, Nice. That's a good one. What's your favorite book? Uh, Except the ones I've written. (laughs) Well, I mean, that could be your favorite too, I guess. Well, there's just so many books. It's hard to tell. I mean, um, I'm not a big horror fan, although I've done a horror movie. Uh, Stephen King wrote a book about writing that I thought was really phenomenal um, because he he delved into what a writer is supposed to do. Um, there are so many books that uh, on mental health that I really like, some uh, very lighthearted stuff. Uh, the Da Vinci Codes I thought was outstanding. Uh, you know, it, the list can go on and on and on. You did the Da Vinci Code. What did you find outstanding about that? 
just the possibility of where um, it led to. I mean, nobody can trace the, the lineage of Jesus, let's say, and right. the whole spirituality of it. And to think that there might be a descendant that's still alive that has his bloodline, kind of fascinating. I mean, we'll never know the truth of it. Uh, you know, the, there's a, a new scroll that just been discovered recently that may upset the whole idea that Jesus was crucified. And they're saying that the, this particular scroll that's, I can't remember how many thousands of years old, says that it was... Um, uh, Pontius Pilate that was crucified and not Jesus. So Ooh. there's a lot of conflicting uh, things about it. So it, to, to have that lineage would be really cool to talk to somebody. Yeah, that'd be good. All right, well, then that leads into this question for you. You get to have dinner with one person. They could have passed or still been alive. Who do you have dinner with, and what do you want to learn from them? Uh, not to sound pedestrian, but I'd love to have dinner with my mom. Yeah. And uh, she was very colorful in her life, uh, strong as nails. She uh, made some decisions that I don't know if I could have done in her position, but it was necessary. And I guess what I would learn from her is her strength, um, why she could go through what she went through and still come out a happy person and full of love. I mean, when my dad died after my third birthday, she was pregnant with a fourth kid, missing. And uh, excuse the noise, we got painters outside. Um, and and um, she still managed in, in an impoverished neighborhood to feed three kids and get us into a middle-class uh, neighborhood. So her strength is just beyond my understanding. I love it. And as a show that loves our moms, that's a great answer right there. Our mom audience is going to, ref- they'll like that one. What? So let, let's just go into that. Your, your father passes at three years old. And I, I like how you said, I was reading one of your things that you said you were growing up in a ghetto, which was an unforgiving neighborhood. Yeah. What, what was that like for you at that moment? Well, to be candid, I, I have to go back to the mindset of what I was like as a child, um, not looking at it as an adult. And as a kid, I think people forget how resilient kids are. So we didn't really, I didn't really realize what I was living through. All I knew is I was out on the streets causing trouble and getting into all sorts of mischief. And it just seemed all normal to me. And it wasn't, uh, but it seemed that way because I was a kid without a perspective. I didn't have any life experience. So um, it was a rough neighborhood. You weren't going down a street unless uh, the kids knew you or you'd get the crap beat out of you. And uh, that just was my normal life. And it didn't, didn't, I didn't have anything to compare it to. Right. And with, with your father passing, what what was the male role model like for you? What were you looking up to? What, what, what did you envision for your life at that point as a kid? What were you aspiring to be? Nothing, to be honest with you, nothing. Really? When he died, I felt incredibly abandoned. Uh, I started having nightmares of falling down a spiral. I was scared to death of going to sleep. Uh, I had no male influence in my life at all. And... Uh, I had to kind of develop my own masculinity on my own. And it was a long, hard process that were uh, implanted along the way. So so to fill that void, a lot of times we look to to people we shouldn't be looking to or that, that, that step into it. So what were you involved in any kind of sports or just a lot of idle time? How are you – what were you like as a child besides just uh, – you know, as, as you search for who you were going to become. Without a role model. And at that point, there was no sports because I had no dad to, to guide me or take me out to the uh, baseball field or take me to a game or any of that nonsense. Uh, so what I was like was a, a street kid, basically. You know, I was looking for ways to uh, get in trouble. You know, we'd go into bus depots and grab their hoses and squirt each other on hot summer days. And <laughs> We'd break windows and, you know, we had stick ball where you have a, yeah. a broom stick and a pink ball. Yeah. And, you know, your neighbor's car was second base. And, of course, Mother O'Leary always had a window broken and we'd all <laughs> scatter like crazy. Um, it, it was um, it was a perspective that I wouldn't want to give anyone. You know, I, w- yeah. I don't wish that on anyone. So East Coast? East Coast, Jersey. Jersey, okay. I was going to say, yeah, we played stickball. I grew up in Maryland, so I, I'm familiar with stickball and definitely playing in fire hydrants. That was a thing. There you go. Yeah, yeah. fire hydrants are great. 
open them up, get a wrench and let the water run. Yeah. Yeah. That was funny. Uh, all right. So then, so that leads you to military school. And I, and I want to spend some time on that because you, you talk about the bullying that went on and the injustice as you saw. So talk to me about like, what age were you when you went off to military school? What was the hope of you going there? And then what was obviously the outcome? Okay, so by the time I was 12 years old, I had gotten into so much trouble that the courts gave my mother and then my stepdad at the time um, a choice, either reform school or sending me to military school. So at 12 years old, my mother put me in a car, drove me to New York City, put me on a train and uh, sent me to Virginia to go to a military school. Uh, And that started a world of hurt for me because as the train started pulling out of the station, I saw my mother turn away and walk away. And for most of my life, I thought she walked away because she didn't love me. I felt another abandonment issue, uh, big time depression and found out on the train that she had given one of the cadets some money to make sure that when we transferred in Washington, D.C., I got on the right train. And of course, I started drinking. I got some guy to give me some beer and I bought, you know, a case for him or six pack for him. And he got me my beer and I got drunk and got into my first fight with one of the cadets. Yeah, we went on it. I was full of blood. He was full of blood. (laughs) It was not a good start. Um, The idea was to try to give me some discipline. And they thought by sending me away to military school, there would be a sense of discipline and some focus so that I wouldn't wind up a criminal, basically. Um, My first night in military school, I got knocked out three times because of my mouth. Now, arguably, we came with a bad attitude. I I was I was ready to fight because I, I felt the world had abandoned me. I. I thought it hated me and I hated it. And it was just nothing that made sense to me. So, of course, the first day and night, um, this guy with all these stripes said something and I mouthed off and he knocked me out. You know, this went on for three times until I finally realized that I was hurting enough to keep my mouth shut. What was going through your mind as you were, you know, in these physical altercations? Like, what? how long were you supposed to even be there? Did you Did you have an idea? Well, my mother and stepdad had envisioned me going from ninth grade all the way through graduation. Ooh. And yeah, uh, and believe me when I tell you, the th- after the third year, I turned to them and I said, if you put me on that train, I promise you faithfully, I will jump off the train and you will never see me again. And they took me serious. They understood that at that point I had had it. Yeah. So that's when they transferred me out of there. So you d- you did three years of this though? Three years. What was, ultimately, what was the impact it had on you? Did it change your behavior or just make you more resolved into, I don't belong here? I think both. Um, It it gave me a perspective of, I knew how to play the system. I started to learn that I didn't have to change who I was or my mindset, but I had to present something where I could stay out of trouble. Uh, I mean, the first three months in military school, I set a record of the the only cadet that had that many demerits because <laughs> I, was, I was still fit for bear. Um, I really didn't care about life. I didn't care about anything. And so nothing mattered to me. They beat me with broomsticks, whipped me with coat hangers. It, it just wasn't going to break me. But eventually I realized all my free time was eaten up with either exercising or marching in circles because... Every demerit required an hour of punishment. Sure. And so Saturday, I couldn't down. I couldn't do anything. I had no free time. And I just spiraled. I just got so depressed about it. Then I woke up one day and said, okay, I'm going to beat these idiots at their own game. Mm. So I started playing the game. I got out of all the demerits. And uh, one of the drill sergeants saw me messing around with my rifle one day. And he said, hey, you look like you're pretty comfortable with that. I said, well, I used to swing a broomstick, you know, in circles and stuff. So this is just another broomstick to me. And he said, would you like to join the drill team? I said, what's in it for me? Right away, Jersey, right? What's yeah. <laughs> and he said, well, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. I said, I'll sign up. So after about six months of that, we had the competition with the entire school from you know, elementary school all the way to the seniors. And I wound up the fourth best drill cadet in the academy. Oh, wow. Just just because I didn't want to do the other crap they had uh, this highlighted for me. And so I worked my way out of all the demerits. And then I got to go downtown to see a movie and eat my popcorn and be left alone. 
I'm trying to think. Like, so for you to realize that you can play the system and still, you know, come out on the other side, what kind of confidence did that give you as a young man? I don't know if it was confidence as much as more of a stubborn because mm. I, I learned how to get past the pain. When I was getting, you know, like we'll call it spanked with a paddle, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't scream. I just called it like that. And they were trying to get me to scream and I just wouldn't do it. So I would rather have had all the pain and not say a word just to give them the satisfaction. So the strength become became one of endurance and a, a willingness to fight through the pain just to not give up who I was. And at that point, I didn't know who I was, but I knew that what they were doing to me wasn't who I wanted to be. Mm, that's that's powerful. So three years, you don't go back for the fourth year? No. no. Where, where does that take you in life? It took me to a private school. Now, here I am thinking, okay, this is my first day of private school. I'm in a jacket, you know, school jacket and stuff, but no military school. And I'm sitting there minding my own business, smoking a cigarette. Now I'm 15 years old at this point. And the six foot two guy comes up and he says, hey, your name Callus? And I look up and I'm thinking to myself, oh, God, don't, don't, please don't start this all over again. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, uh, you're the kid that went to military school. I said, uh, yeah, I yeah. He said, did they teach you how to kill? I said, yeah, but it's nothing that I use as my resume piece. No, I mean, <laughs> And he said, well, stand up. I want you to kill me. Oh. And I looked at him. I said, look, I really don't want any trouble. Like, clearly, you're really tall. You're really big. And you could probably beat the crap out of me. So why don't we just say that you win? Can we leave it at that? He wouldn't. So for three years, he would push me, spit on me, call me a greasy Greek. Um, you know, and he humiliated, humiliated me in front of the whole school every chance he could. I spoke to the headmaster multiple occasions, said, look, I'm telling you, I've got a really bad temper. And if I lose it, I'm not going to be responsible for what I do to this kid. Sure. You need to control him. And he said, well, we're trying to help everybody. You know, there's not much we can do. We've spoken to him. And I said, you're on notice. I'm telling you now, I, I can be pushed and pushed and pushed. And someday it's going to snap. So uh, what led to that is um, the coach of soccer came up to me and he said, why aren't you playing any sports? And so he got it out of me about my dad and the fact I hadn't. And he said, why don't you learn to play soccer? I said, coach, uh, you know, I really appreciate it, but sports, no, it's not my thing. He said, you can't live life like this. you got to get out and do some sports. Mm. So I got out and started playing soccer. And uh, I'll, I'll get back to in a second. But I, what I wanted to do is go to the next step, which is my chemistry teacher came to me and says, hey, uh, you want to get an A in chemistry? I said, sure. Why? He goes, good. You're on the wrestling team. I said, oh, I don't want to be honest with you. And then my <laughs> hockey coach did the same thing to me. So uh, as it turned out, I became uh, undefeated in wrestling and a really good defenseman. And then going back to the soccer, um, my third year playing soccer, uh, I was up for co-captain of the team. And this tall guy stands up and says, we can't have him. He doesn't even stand up for his own rights. And I snapped because I really wanted to be co-captain. I said, look, jerk. Anytime, any place. And he said, right now. So I ran up to him and he punched me, knocked me down. I got up. He punched me, knocked me down. I got up. He punched me, knocked me down. As I'm getting up, all the adrenaline went to my head and I thought, oh, dear. And uh, I ran up to him and I kicked him square in the um, <laughs> private part. Yeah. And he fell on the ground and I jumped on him. And because I was a wrestler, I was able to pin his arms and I started digging my fingernails behind his eyes and he started bleeding because I was going to bow his eyes. I literally was going to pull his eyes out of his head. And the whole team had to drag me off. The coach grabbed me. I went like that and punched him in the face, not not knowing it was him, but I was sure. just. So I went to my room and the coach came down. I said, coach, before you say a word, I'm so sorry. I embarrassed you and the whole team, myself. Uh, I, I just been warning everyone this wasn't going to happen. He said, you got to come back to the field. I said, I can't, I can't. It's, I'm too, too humiliated by it. He goes, John, you just got unanimously selected as co-captain of the team, including him. Oh, wow. Yeah. So um, after that, never had a problem with him. And I sat with the coach and I said, you know, coach, I got to be honest with you. This is really sick. He said, what do you mean? I said, do you realize that for three years I've been humiliated and done everything because I believe so deeply in peace and I didn't want to have the mindset of a military person and stuff. And 
the only way I could get respect was through violence. That's not what I'm about. I realize now that's not what I'm about and it's not going to be my life path. And I just, I, I think you're all sick, every one of you, because if that's how you have to prove yourself in life, I don't want any part of it. And um, at 15 years old, I had gotten so lost in my head that one night I went down to the dock, it was half frozen lake, and I decided I was going to end my life. And I jumped into the lake and I wanted to drown myself. And that was one of the moments where my mind said, I don't want to die. There's got to be something better in life than this, and I need to find it. Now, by doing that one thought, I don't know where it came from, it set me on a whole different mindset to start figuring out life. And what, what was the mindset shift? I guess the mindset shift was, even though I had no friends, I felt depressed and, and all that, there had to be something better. I had to find something that would start my recovery. Now, I'm telling you this from a, uh, an adult perspective. The, the mindset of the child was probably quite different, but I had to find a way to start mentally curing myself, some sort of recovery, some some way to reach out and find some happiness in life, something that I could put my anchor on and something that I could um, feel comfortable with. And believe it or not, my math teacher pulled me in. He says, I understand you have a problem with authority. I said, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. He said, you know, life is very uh, subjective or objective. He said, I know when you write a paper, anyone can criticize and give you a different point of view and criticize your writing and all that. I said, right. He said, but math is different. I said, what do you mean? He goes, one plus one will always equal two. There's no discussion. Nobody can call you wrong. So in math, everything has a system. Mm. It has a formula and it has an end answer that if you do it right, you'll get the right answer and nobody can argue it. And that, believe it or not, woke me up to thinking about it. I said, if I can find things that I can feel confident that one and one is always two, no matter what anyone else's opinion is, at least I know it's what I feel and what I want to be and what I want to do. Wow. So where did that lead you then? Well, that led me to um, searching more towards uh, being a better student. Mm -hmm. uh, I found that sports gave me an outlet to get all my aggression out. Uh, I, I found I could leave everything, all my emotion on the field. And believe me, when I tell you, I, I was a tough son of a gun. Um, yeah. My, my hockey coach came up to the team because I was leaving senior year. And he said, come here, I want to talk to you guys. So we all gathered. He said, Callis here is leaving us and you should watch him play hockey. And I'm thinking, where is he going with this? And he goes, there's always two things that can buy, get by Callis, either the man or the puck. I've never seen both go by him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the guy would be coming running down and I'd get really low and I'd, I'd usually knock him into the stands. That's how hard I was hitting these sure. kids. Uh, of course, I suffered with a couple of sticks on my back. It's <laughs> part of the game. Um, so I, I think it started to give me some confidence and strength that if I applied myself the way I wanted to, not the way anyone else told me to, then I could take life as a blank piece of paper and say, okay, I, I, I got it. I got dealt a real crappy hand in the beginning. Do you want to live in the crap or do you want to take this blank piece of paper and start defining how your life to look? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that was a big turning point for me. Wow. So let me skip for how do you end up in Hollywood? Okay, so when I started college, um, I started it as a chemistry major because I wanted to cure cancer, which is what my dad died. And after a while, the chemistry teacher took me for a walk. And, he, and I said, uh, is there a problem, sir? He says, no, you know, you do three hour labs in 45 minutes and you're the best student in the class. And I've already spoken to the academic department. Uh, you're not any longer in my class. And I said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused here. Why? What is that? He goes, so I'm sitting on the grass and this African-American friend of mine came over and said, what's up, John? And I told her and she goes, well, you want to help me? And I'm thinking, well, I have nothing better. I thought she wanted me to move some furniture or help her with that, right? She took me to the theater. And she's, and I said, what am I doing here? She goes, well, we need help reading some lines. I said, I'm not an actor. She goes, no, just read the lines. It's okay. So about a half hour into that, I turned to the director and said, hey, I got to go. Uh, I got to go do my homework. He goes, you can't leave a rehearsal. 
And I looked at Liz and she's got this big smile on her face. I said, what do you mean rehearsal? He goes, but you're playing the leading man in this play. I said, oh, oh, no, I'm not. He goes, yeah, oh, yeah, you are. So I looked at Liz, she goes, give it a try. And after the first rehearsal, the cast came around me, we all talked and it was another one of those moments where I said, wow, I found people I can relate to. They're, they're, they're all talking about how the characters work and they made me feel like I was part of a family. And so from there, I went to Colorado to um, a college which offered the University Without Walls, which if a, if a kid knew what he was doing, you could structure a curriculum that fit your needs. Mm. And the head of the department took me under a wing and got me an internship at um, a, a theater in Denver. And uh, that's a whole long story that's hysterical, which if we have time, I can go back and tell you. But um, so I did that. And then I moved out to L.A. to do my master's degree um, in theater. And I took a minor in filmmaking with a woman named Chick Strand, a, a very well-known documentary filmmaker. And I did this little eight millimeter film, which was required. And she said, John, stay after class. I thought, oh, good. No, it's fine. <laughs> out of filmmaking, right? And she goes, um, I know you want to kind of look at being an actor. I said, yeah, I, I'm looking at it. She goes, nah. I said, what do you mean, nah? She goes, you've got too good an eye. You're either a director or a director of photography. Trust me on this. I've been at this a long time. Mm -hmm. So I went back to my um, head of my department who was getting me through my master's degree. And I said, hey, this is what's going on. What do you think? And he said, makes sense to me. You've got the mind. You just need to, to figure it out. And from there, I met a guy uh, while I was doing my master's degree in a little restaurant. He was all dressed in white and everyone was laughing at, you know, that he was all in white. And he came over and sat next to me and he said, what are you doing? I told him, he's like, hey, can I come see the play? I said, sure. Because uh, I was doing a play for my master's degree. And about six months later, I asked him what he did in life. And he said he was an art director in film. So he got me on a, on a set. Uh, and um, the guy that came over to me on the set turned out to be Harry Wallman, who was the original stuntman in The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And... He had me in his van wrapping crime report, which I didn't know what it was. And I said, what is this stuff? And he goes, it's an explosive. I jump out of the van. I said, are you out of your mind? I don't know what I'm doing. He goes, nah. And he's got the flame going. He goes, see, nothing could happen. Don't worry about it. So he took me under his wing. And then I started working my way through the art department. I became a dialogue director. And it, it just snowballed for a long time. And then everything fell out of the bottom. I slipped back into my depressive thing. I thought, oh, shoot. I'm a failure. And I woke up and said, no, you're not. You got to find something else. So I built the brick wall in Sunset. I became a council unemployment agency. I became a waiter. And then a production manager came in and started laughing because he saw me as a waiter. I said, hey, I got a tray full of food. You, you can wear it if you can laughing. Yeah. He said, he said, I'm starting a picture. You want to be the prop master? I said, sure. So after that, I never turned around. I just started working different jobs and worked my way up. That's fascinating. How did, so it's interesting when I listen to your story, John, is all the different people that reached out to you at times that maybe you weren't believing in yourself, right? To open a door for you, to kind of guide you through it. And I think that's so important for our community to understand is one, to be open to receive, right? Because it, and what I've done episodes on this where I talk about some of the best things in our life aren't really our plans. Maybe our plan right. isn't what's best for us, but somebody else sees something and guides us, and all of a sudden we have a whole new plan that we didn't even know was possible. And then on the flip side, I also like to share the responsibility of looking out for somebody else. When you, when you see that youngster that's pushing away, you see the, the person that used to be bubbly and part of the the crowd that now isolates themselves the steps aside like let's not let people stay out there bring them back in right open yeah. the dialogue and include because right like you said you know you could put a smile on your face and, and pretend everything's all right but inside you're hurting and a lot of times all it takes is one one other person to come up and ask you what's going on or to share with you to, to bring you out of that yep i agree and I love that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, please. I love, you know, reading your bio, who you've worked with and stuff. But I really love that you, you, you go back to, hey, I wasn't always good. And let me share with you some of the times I'm not good. And that's in your book, your current book, because I know you, you write quite a few, When the Rain Stops. And, and I wanted to ask you about 
what brought you back full circle with all the success you've had and, and all the influence you have now, it'd be easy to sit back and not feel responsibility to share this. What made you want to share it at this stage of life? I guess what started it was, um, I, I felt I needed some help. I had more answers or questions than answers. And so I started therapy and the therapist I walked into, I told him what was basically going on. He said, why don't you just write a few pages about what, mm. what happened and let's talk about it. So I did, I handed it to him. The next session I walked in, he, he, he had tears in his eyes and he hugged me. He says, I have no idea how you turned out like this. I said, really? He goes, with what you started life with, chances of you coming out like this are really rare. And he says, I encourage you to keep writing. So I did. I started kind of almost like a journal. Mm-hmm. And the more I wrote, um, the more I thought, well, maybe there's something in here. And so I talked to a friend of mine who's a really skillful writer and an editor. And he said, why don't you just write the whole thing out? I mean, you're at an age where you have a perspective. So I started writing it. And there were times where my wife would go by my office. I'd be crying like a baby. And she'd say, you OK? And I said, yeah, I'm just... I'm trying to relive it as the child instead of having an adult view of it, which would be a different truth. Right. Uh, and when I said that to her, I realized I needed to have two voices in the book. The first boy voice is the little boy going through everything that I went through. And the second voice, which is in that gray box you see in, in throughout the book, of the adult looking back and saying, okay, what I experienced as a child was true at that moment for that child. But in hindsight, it wasn't the truth. It was a different truth. Like my mother turning away later in life when we had that conversation, she said, honey, I turned away because I didn't want you to see me crying. I was putting a 12 year old baby on a train and I just burst out crying and we hugged. And it was a cathartic moment for my mom and I to get back together. So it's um, as I was writing it, I, I kept thinking maybe by being honest and telling my story somebody else maybe is going through the same thing and can see that there is a path to recovery and that you can have a better life and you don't need to always stay in that depressed state and you need to take responsibility and understand sometimes mentors come into your life and they push you in a direction that you don't even know you're being pushed and guided and one day you wake up and say, oh, this is what I want to be. And you have no idea that we're, you have no idea you're being guided. But all these mentors, which you eventually realized they were, kept pushing you in the direction that they all saw you needed to go that you didn't see yourself. Mm. And um, even, I mean, one of the my famous moments in life was when my art teacher in front of the class said, Mr. Callis here presented this thing, which was a toilet with flowers coming out of it. And the symbolism of it, I went through this whole thing and I'm thinking, I don't know where that's coming from. He goes, this is what an artist does. And I went home with this beaming glow in me thinking, somebody call me an artist. So all of the mentoring and all the pushing came to a head at that moment. I said, okay, I'm an artist. And uh, I decided that that's really what I wanted to do. Now, again, even having that cathartic moment was not a guarantee or an easy path. There was a lot of stuff that needed to be done yeah and i think that's that's the beautiful part right is you didn't go into this looking for answers for an easy path but what you found is you found yourself and you found an identity of okay i can be an artist now all the hard work makes sense to you because it's you it's not for it's not somebody else it's it's who you you are And, and i love how many people come into your life that didn't have to. In my book, that I mean, my whole book is sharing stories about people that come into my life and, and played a role uh, to really shape who I am. And, and I think it's so, I think one of the greatest things we can do in our life is give back to them and say thank you and share their stories to inspire somebody else to give to somebody else. So what would you, Praise what would Praise. you, if, they're, if they were listening, if the hockey coach, the chemistry teacher, all of them that gave you, what would you say to them right now? Thank you for guiding me in the direction I need to be guided. And thank you for not giving up on mm. me when I gave up on myself. I love that. And that's because that's what I was thinking too, working with young adults and high school students specifically. Um, I had a mentor that told me when you see like a teenager pushing you away, they're testing you to see if you'll quit on them because in 
if you look into their life, a lot of people have given up on them already, whether it's family, friends, former coaches. So when they push away, it's not because they don't want to belong. It's not because they don't want to feel love. It's because they want to test you to see if you'll quit before they commit to you. I did that with my wife uh, when I first <laughs> married her. I, I'm being real serious. I, I unconsciously kept pushing her away, pushing, and she wouldn't go. And um, October 12th this year, we're celebrating our 32nd anniversary. Ah, so, congratulations, my friend. Yeah, well, we should congratulate me and offer her condolences. <laughs> <laughs> she taught me unconditional love, and uh, it, it became a very deep part of my life because of her, her um, encouragement and never giving up. Ah, fantastic. Let me ask this. Did you have any reservations about speaking out about mental wellness or specifically sharing your story and having any repercussions within the industry you're working or the roles you'd be able to get? Absolutely none, because everything I speak about is from my heart. It's honest. And I, if there's one thing I've learned in life is if you say something honest, and people want to come at you, those are the people you don't want to be near. For sure. You cannot put up with fake people, negative people, vitriolic people. Uh, so if somebody wants to criticize me for coming forward and trying to help other people, then they're really not the kind of person I want to be around. Yeah, no, I 100% love it. And I, and I wanted to get that out because – I think there are probably people listening to this episode somewhere in the world that are like, ah, I, I want to speak up or I want to share my story, but I'm, I'm hesitant because what somebody else is going to think, what, what maybe, maybe the job won't like that I said this or somebody won't like. And, and that's what I tell them too is if they don't like you because you're sharing your story, they probably shouldn't be in your circle of influence anyhow. You know, having said that, I think there's a way to share your story without pooping on somebody else's. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, the military school. I had the worst three years of my life. But on other podcasts, I've, uh, I've made this statement saying there are kids that went to that school, same school, that wanted to be military career kids, and they absolutely loved it there. They couldn't wait to get up and put the uniform on and go out and march and all that. And to them, I say, God bless you. You yeah. know, if that's what you want in your life, you should pursue that. It wasn't a fit for me. Yeah. So in any given situation, if you find yourself like that and somebody's criticizing you, just say, hey, thanks very much. You know, I have a different spin on it. I'll talk to you later and walk away. Yeah. There's no reason to talk to a brick wall. No. And, and that, what I love is, John, when your light shines bright, you attract others who are shining bright. There you and, go. And... And that's what we're after, right? If we all have good conversations and share our stories and admit we're human, that we're, even though I have success on the outside, on the inside, I, I'm still a work in progress. When we talk about that stuff, we just make our little piece of the world a little better. Yeah, and I also think it's especially important for men to do exactly what mm. you just said, because often we're raised with, come on, you're a man, you're not supposed to cry, you're not supposed to have emotions, you know, suck it up, move on and all that. And it's not the right messaging. You know, we're human, we have emotions, <clears throat> and we're entitled to share them. Not only are we entitled to share them, we need to share them. Need to share them. Right? We need to talk with each other. We're brothers in arms. Mm. You're fighting that sun, huh? I, I, well, it's crazy because it was pouring rain when I started, and now all of a sudden the sun came out, and I you're, got a... You're very angelic, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I don't get told that very often. So There you go. <laughs> Angelic and me don't usually go in the same sentence, but I'll take it today. Yeah. I'll, I'll take it as I sit in the woods in Oregon talking to my friend John. Um, I, I wanted to get something from you on the Hollywood side, not necessarily the names and stuff. I think, well, it's impressive. What did you learn from being around people at such a high level, like that are so good at what they do. What did you learn from that? Well, I, I think what I learned mo mostly is that most of us um, put celebrities in a very high esteem and almost uh, on pedestals. What I learned very quickly is they have a job to do. It's called acting and they're doing their job. They do it very well, but they also put on the, their pants the same way I do. Mm. They eat food the same way I do. And I found 98% of all of the top celebrities I worked with were human beings. Love it. A couple of them were divas, but you got to expect that in any business, you yeah. know, nobody's going to be perfect and all that. But um, I never 
I never got um, hurt by any of them. I always looked at them as human beings. And if there was one moment that maybe I was the most embarrassed in my life, <laughs> but I was asked to bring an envelope to the gym where Robert De Niro was uh, rehearsing his fight scene for Raging Ball. And I and the guy, the executive producer said, John, give this to De Niro and wait for an answer. I said, okay. Now, again, I'm not awestruck with anyone, but De Niro, for some reason, it was like, oh my God, oh, this yeah. is the top of the top. Right? Yeah. So I held the envelope up and he held his glove up. He said, yeah, a minute, let me finish. So he finishes, he's unwrapping his glove. He pulls it out, puts his hand out and says, hi, what's your name? And I'm shaking his hand. I go, Robert De Niro. <laughs> now, at that moment, he could have said something. He goes, he smiles. He goes, no, no, that's my name. What's your name? <laughs> and I just about wanted to crap my pants. I was so embarrassed. I said, oh, John Phillips, here's your envelope. Gotta go. And I started walking. Goes, Wait a minute. Don't you need an answer? I said, oh, yes, that's true. And he, he kept smiling at me. And he didn't make me feel like crap. He just, he recognized at that moment what was going on. Mm. And it was kind of a embarrassing but really cute moment for me. He's one of my favorite actors. I I, I can watch him in dang near any show he's in and just be amazed. He's incredibly skillful. What? And then follow up to that question is, what did you teach them, do you think? Well, there's an, another instance on Raging Bull that um, the actress on it, I don't want to mention her name, but you probably figured out, was her first day on the set. And this, they found her as a waitress and they said, oh, you got to play this part. Okay. And so, yeah, so she says, excuse me. And I said, yes, can I ask you a question, please? I said, sure, what? She goes, um, is there any chance I can get a cigarette? I said, yeah, let me go get you one. So I gave her one. About a week later, I heard her saying some, to some PA, hey, you, come here, go get me a pack of cigarettes. And I went to her dressing room and I closed the door. I said, um, excuse me, but um, what happened from that sweet woman to you becoming a raging bitch on the set? And she <laughs> looked at me and said, what? I said, you don't treat people like that. These people are here to support you 100%. They'll do whatever you want. And she just went... I am so sorry. She said, I've just been caught up. I mean, if you sneeze, somebody's there with a tissue. If, if you need a cup of coffee, they're there stirring your coffee and almost feeding it to you. She said, I just got lost. And I said, it's an easy power drug to swallow. It's also a very difficult power drug to show humility. Mm. So I think she learned that from me. Um, the other people, I don't know if they learned anything, but I think they appreciated the fact that I treated them as they should be a professional, like, you know, make sure they knew what they were doing, uh, you know, what they needed and all that was taken care of. And I never, oh my God, you're, you're Mel Gibson. Oh my God. None of that stuff. You know, it's like, Hey Mel, nice to meet you. Um, Katie, would you like a cup of coffee or anything? He said, no, I'm cool. Thanks. I said, okay, I'll, I'll come get you in about 10 minutes when we're ready. And it was that kind of flow and easiness that um, I think they appreciated. I love it. If you could, as we get close to wrapping up, John. Okay. If you could give somebody some advice that, that you know, maybe maybe they're struggling with their, their self-image, with their place in the world, maybe pursuing a dream that they've put off for years. What would you tell them today? You would tell them to sit yourself down and quiet your mind for a couple minutes and then say, what is it I really want to be? Once you've identified that, then the next step is to say, okay, where am I in that process? If I want to be this and I'm identifying myself here, what are the steps that I need to take to get to that point? Mm -hmm. So look at life as a blank piece of paper and start your script and say, I'm going on a journey to blah. Recognize there are going to be stumbles. Recognize there's going to be frustration, hard times. You're going to get fired, maybe. You're going to get hired again. Just don't give up on it. Just keep working day to day and keep moving the goalposts. It's consistency. It's a belief in yourself and knowing where you are. Don't overstep your boundaries. If you're working in a corporation as an assistant, don't think tomorrow you should be the CEO and start giving advice. Keep your ears and eyes open and your mouth shut and learn. <laughs> That's some Keep old learning. school advice there. It always and it works. I mean, yeah. it's really good advice. So I, I would say accept help. Um, don't be afraid to go to therapy. Don't mm -hmm. talk to your friends about, you know, what you're going through because they're going to be useless to you. And, you know, you, 
you need a professional mental health practitioner to help you through some really difficult stuff. And they will unwind things so that you can understand it better from your own perspective and what your needs are. And just keep working at it. Don't give up on yourself. And if you really fall into a pigeonhole, uh, send me an email and I would be more than happy to help you through it. Mm, I love it. Well, let's let's go there. Where can we connect with you, John? Where can our community find you to support you? Obviously, the book, When the Rain Stops, is out on Amazon. It is. Uh, where else can they connect with you? Well, I'm on all social medias. I have a website, uh, johncallis.com, and it has my entire background so they can see what I've done. <clears throat> I've had people call me and say, hey, I want to be in commercials. Can you give me advice? So I talked to them about that. One woman from Instagram called me and said, I'm really having a bad day and I don't know what to do. And we talked for about an hour and a half. And she, she was crying at the end and said, I feel like my mother who died years ago, just was, you channeled her. She, mm -hmm. You're giving me the exact advice she would have given me. So make a difference in other people's lives and you will have served and you will be served. And there's nothing better than to wake up one morning and say, yesterday I helped somebody and their life is better because of it. Mm. John, I want to thank you so much for for spending time with us today and more importantly for sharing your story to help people around the world and to pay thanks to all those that invested in you. I think that's one of the greatest things we can do. You're very welcome, and I hope your audience gets some benefit out of it. No doubt they will, John. Thanks so much. And remember, team, life is far too short to live any other way than on purpose. We'll see you all again next week.